Did anybody not get a handout? Would you lift your hand up real high if you did not receive one tonight? Uh, our ushers would be glad to give you one. Uh, the rest of you turn to 1 Peter chapter number 3. 1 Peter chapter number 3. Tonight we're going to continue our marriage series. And uh, I want to do part two of the lesson, What Every Wife Needs to Succeed. And I started out last week by making this statement, women often baffle men. And when I said that, some of you guys wanted to say amen, but you were afraid your wife would elbow you if you did, so you didn't. But women often baffle men. And uh, 1 Peter 3, 7 gives us a great admonishment, guys. And it says this in 1 Peter 3, 7, Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them, that is your wife, according to knowledge. Dwell with them according to knowledge. In other words, know your wife. Know your wife. She's different than you. And you need to get to know her. Um, I gave you the statement in your handout there from last week that I think that most men, it's not that they're unwilling to meet their wife's needs. What I find a lot is that, guys, we're just unaware of what the needs are. It's not that we are rebellious or that we're hateful or that we don't want to meet their needs. We do. We just, a lot of times... We just don't know how to, we don't know what the needs are, so we, therefore we can't meet them. And a lot of times, like I said, I think we're shooting in the dark when it comes to understanding our wives. But, you know, guys, we, we can't just plead ignorance, you know, and uh, we, we can't, that's not going to work. Pleading ignorance isn't going to make your marriage work. Uh, you know, pleading ignorance isn't going to work when we stand before the Lord one day. Uh, 1 Peter 3, 7 says that I have a responsibility to dwell with my wife according to to knowledge. I need to get to know her. And uh, last week we began to look at four key words, and we covered two of those. And uh, the first key word, because here's the thing, what we've been, we've been building as we go. The first week, you know, we gave you a general introductory lesson on marriage and how a lot of people try to make marriage work the wrong way, and that's why it fails. And we looked at that. Then we began to look at the husband's core role in marriage. And we saw that the husband's core role is to be a servant leader. He used to provide leadership for the home, but a, a different kind of leadership that, uh, that Jesus described as servant leadership. You lead by serving. And we saw that's our core role, guys, in the home. But then, now we've come back, and we're examining four key words that really are our core concerns. We saw our core role. These are our core concerns. And what was the first one? Say it with me. It was what? Is it in your notes there? I don't have a copy. Um, let me, well, I hate to take yours. Okay. Uh, companionship, all right? Um, uh, and again, it goes back to this verse about knowing our wives. Um, you know, when you dated, you wanted to get to know her. Amen? And uh, you wanted to get to know her, and you came up with all kinds of crazy things and crazy ways to get to know her, uh, maybe stay up till two in the morning and uh, you, you know on the phone or whatever. But you just you came up with all kinds of crazy ways to be together, crazy things to to do together, and you just wanted to 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 be together, you know, and get to know each other. And what happens is many times then, uh, you know, you get married, and your wife she is expecting that companionship to continue. She looks at the wedding ceremony as the beginning of a never-ending relationship, you know, with a lot of deep sharing. And, uh, uh, and, and our wives want to experience life with their man in a very deep and intimate and never-ending way. And uh, for a lot of times what happens is wives get disappointed after they get married because that companionship of the courtship days doesn't really continue. And uh, those, those things that you did to be together and all, the, you know, just, you just wanted to do everything together. Then what can happen is after you get married, you can end up going what? Separate ways. That's right. You end up going your separate ways. And of course, that brings untold hurt to her because that's not at all what she was expecting. And we said that when men take time to just be with their wife, just be with her. Doesn't that you're not doing anything high dollar? It's not that you're out buying her stuff. But when you just take time to be with her, you are paying your wife the supreme compliment. Because more than anything else, she expects to have you. 
to have your presence and your interest and your availability. She needs your companionships. And that's why Peter said, dwell with them according to knowledge. But then the second thing we looked at was security. And that is, we went to Ephesians chapter 5, and we saw that that a, a woman needs to know that her man can and will provide for her. Uh, as Christ sacrificed for our well-being, as, as men, we should be willing to sacrifice ourselves for our wife and for her well-being. And uh, the, the husband is to love and to take care of his wife, we saw, as he would his own body. And uh, boy, that's a, that's a tall order, but that's what the Bible teaches. Now, the third thing I want to give you tonight, and this is where I guess you need to start writing, the third key word when we talk about the husband's core concerns and the wife's needs is significance. The word significance. Um, and, and right away you may think, well, you know, why is that? Why does our wife need to sense from us guys that she's significant? And in your handout it says this, because so much of what the wife does is hidden from view. It's hidden from view. Um, her most valuable contributions are primarily relational. That is, your wife is a nurturer. She's a friend. She's a soul worker. And those contributions, to be honest with you, are very difficult to try to measure. Nor is she going to get paid for those things. You know, I was thinking about when I grew up as a kid... There in, in Missouri, and my mother's still alive, and I, I love her, and I talk to her all the time on the phone. And, uh, you know, I thought, I thought about the things my mom did to make me feel special. And as I got to thinking about it, I thought, well, what was it? Because she did. She made me feel special, but how? And I thought, well, I remember I'd come home from school, and she'd have my favorite cookies cooking in the oven. And... Uh, I'm hoping that to get some of those again tonight when I get home. <laughs> My wife has the batter in the refrigerator, ready to go. I'd come home from school and I'd come busting through the door. Mom, 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 what, what? I got an A on my test at school. Really? And I mean, she made me feel like I was the smartest kid up there, you know, at that school. And she would hang on every word I said. Oh, tell me about it. And I'd go through the whole day and what happened and who said this and who said that and about my test and this. And she would just listen like it was the most important thing in the world. Guys, that's really difficult for us to do. Now, some of you guys are different than me or maybe you just won't admit it, but let's just be honest for a second, guys. Our kids have about a 30-second window to get our attention and to express themselves. And then what happens, guys? We're thinking about mowing the grass, the football game. We're thinking about work, uh, you know, but not our wives. Our wives just hang on every word. You know, when I grew up, my dad was out of town a lot. My dad would be out of town, you know, at least two nights a week, sometimes more. And for me, that was kind of traumatic, you know, to, when my dad was gone. I didn't like that, you know. And a lot of times I get scared, like little kids do. And when I would get scared, my mom would let me come in and sleep with her. And I remember the first time I ever heard about war and I understood what war was. And I remember as a little kid how, how scared I was. I grew up during the Cold War era. And I remember, you know, people talking about the Russians are going to blow us up. And I remember being so scared about war. And I can remember one night crawling and jumping in bed with my mom and tears just streaming down my face. And I was so scared. And she snuggled up to me. And she soothed all my fears. She just calmed down all my apprehension. It was gone. Mom took care of it. Mom babied me when I was sick. Now, my brothers would say she babied me, period, because I was they were here, but they're not here, so I'm, we're not going to let them talk. But they're, they're 9 and 11 years older than me, but uh, mom babied me when I was sick. Mom cried when my dog died. 
She'd cook my favorite meals when Dad was out of town. She hugged me. She would, let me tell you something. My boys can tell you, when Grandma hugs you, you know you've been hugged. <laughs> I mean, she'd grab me and pull me into her and put them arms around me and she'd bear hug me and she'd say, you're my precious baby. <laughs> and I was 14 years old. She showed affection. Now, Dad wasn't so much that way. You know, you knew Dad loved you. Dad wasn't much to say it. And Dad wasn't much on, you know, hugging and all that stuff, you know. But, uh, but boy, Mom was affectionate. And, uh, you know, I'd played baseball, and I'd have white baseball pants. And I'd go out there and play baseball, and I'd have grass stains all over my pants. When I got at, done after the game... But you know, it was the weirdest thing. When the next game rolled around, guess what? They were white again. They were, I didn't know how. They were just white again. I'd go to my drawer in the morning, and boy, that underwear drawer is full again. <laughs> Wonder how that happens. You know, how do you measure that? How do you measure all that stuff I just said? I mean... You know, guys, we produce at work and we get a raise or a promotion or we get recognized. But you see, your wife, the, there's only one person who can really appreciate her unique contributions. There's only one person who can really honor her accordingly. You know who that is? Her husband. I want you to get that in your handout. That's her husband. You see, in 1 Peter 3, well, we're going to go to that in just a second, but before we hit 1 Peter 3, 7, and I want to hit on another part of that verse. Did, did you know that when I grew up, I never thought to say thank you as a kid that my pants were white again? I never thought to say thank you that my underwear drawer was full again. You know, and now I see those same traits in my wife. And, boy, I appreciate it now. You know, when, when our kids, whenever they would get hurt outside, and they'd get a scrape, or they'd fall down on the pavement, they never wanted me when they got hurt. Never wanted me. I mean, I can remember so many times Caleb getting hurt. And he'd go, you know, he'd be crying. I'd say, let me look at it. I want mom. He, he'd go running inside. Well, come here and let me look at it. I want mom. She knows what to do. And there he goes off inside. And I'd go inside and I'd be following him in there, you know, and Mom's got him up on the table looking at it and fixing it all up, you know. And, you know, who, who, can, who can really put value on my wife's contribution? Really, just me. That's why 1 Peter 3, 7 says what it says. It says, likewise, you husbands, see, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge. Now look at the next phrase, giving what? Honor unto the wife. Whose job is it to give her honor? Husbands, if you don't praise her, who will? Who else knows and values what your wife does at home? The children don't fully perceive it. They certainly aren't inclined to thank her for it. The neighbors don't know what she does. Your employer, your boss couldn't care less unless it impacts your performance at work. If she holds a job outside the home, her employer couldn't care less about what she does. All he at home, all she he cares about is her performance at work. Society pays little attention to her contributions in the home. So who is there to praise her? Who is there to compliment her for for her value, for her importance as a wife and a mother? Who is there to honor her? No one but you, friend. 
You are the only one. And here is the tragedy. Over the last 40, 50 years, many women have felt unappreciated and insignificant in serving their families, and many of them have given up on it, unfortunately. It's not worth it, they say. And so then they go searching all these other places to try to find significance. Did you know that in Proverbs 31, 28, when it describes the virtuous woman, do you know what it says there? And I've got that, that, that um, verse reference listed in your handout. But do you know what that verse says? It, it says there in Proverbs 31, 28, it, do, it goes through and it describes the virtuous woman. And then here's what it says. It says that her husband praiseth her. Her husband praiseth her. And all I'm asking is this. Do you make your wife feel significant that, hey, her life counts? In your handout, it says there's no way that you can do that if you aren't affirming her on a daily basis. Now, let me say something tonight to the ladies. Ladies, if, if society doesn't recognize the significance of what you do. And if the neighbors don't recognize it and the kids don't appreciate it, and even your own husband, even though, guys, we're supposed to do it, but if, if the husband chooses to not do it, or maybe he's oblivious to, to all your valuable contributions in the home, and if he doesn't honor you and he doesn't make you feel significant, can I challenge you tonight, ladies, to understand this? Even if he doesn't, you know what? You need to understand and realize you are significant in Christ. And you need to understand that because Satan will try and convince you otherwise. Satan wants you to look for your significance in your work or in your relationships or in your outward appearance or in your education or in your outward visible accomplishments. But these are satanic deceptions. And what happens is, ladies, you end up feeling inferior and you end up feeling worthless when you, when you take Satan's bait. Because you know what? Some other lady is going to be prettier than you. Some other woman is going to be more educated than you. Some other woman is going to have a better job than you. Some other woman is going to have a better marriage than you. And you need to understand, ladies, that regardless if anybody values what you do, that you are significant in Christ. You are God's temple. You are a minister of reconciliation. You are an ambassador for Jesus Christ. You are, the Bible says, God's co-worker. You are seated with Christ in the heavenly realm. You are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus. You can approach the throne of God with freedom and with confidence, and you can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth you. And you are significant in Christ. And so don't allow Satan to try to get you to go out here and look for significance everywhere else. You are significant in Christ. Now, having said that, guys, we can't just say, that's right, just find it in Christ. <laughs> Don't look for it from me. You see, there, there's, a, there's two things working here, okay? The, the one thing working is, yeah, she needs to find her significance in Christ. But on a human level, guess what? She needs to hear it from you. You say, why? Because it's biblical. Because it's right. I mean, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. It's just the right thing to do for husbands to praise their wife. It's the right thing to do to look what's, what, for what's good in your wife. It's the right thing to do to, to praise her and to make her feel significant. It's the right thing to do, according to the Bible, to honor your wife and to, and to, and to, make her, and to realize the valuable contributions that she makes to your family, to your life, to your home. You see, that's the right thing to do because the Bible says giving honor unto the wife. And then, the last thing tonight I want to show you is the fourth need that your wife has is emotional, emotional responsiveness. Go to Ephesians 5, please. Turn over to Ephesians chapter number 5 after you write that in. Ephesians chapter number 5. 
this is challenging to me right here, guys. This is kind of out of the box here a little bit for a lot of us. It really is. Ephesians 5.29 is really out of the box for, for us, guys. But yet, it's in the Bible, and we know this is what we need to be doing. And there's only one way to do it, and that's through Christ in you. You can't do this stuff. You know, you, you cannot meet these needs in and of yourself. You cannot grit your teeth and do it. It's only through Christ working in you and through you that you can do it. Are you with me tonight? It's only through Christ in you. Only through Christ living through you. You see, I need Christ to live through me. I need him to, to be the issue. I need him to be the one living his life through me in relationship to my wife. And, and to my children and everybody, but we're talking about the context of a husband and wife, you know, it's, it's got to be a daily humbling of yourself and a daily yielding of yourself. And, it, and when you're driving home, you know, to the house and you know she's going to be there and maybe she's going to be stressed out or she's had a hard day or, you know, the, the kids were this or that and they're driving her crazy. And you, you have to go home and as you're driving home, yield yourself to Christ in you. You have to yield yourself to the Holy Spirit you have to ask Christ to fill you. That when you go home, you'll be the servant leader that God's called you to be. And that you will go home. And that you will seek to, to meet these needs in your wife's life. It can only happen through Christ strengthening you in the inner man. His spirit strengthening you in the inner man, Ephesians 3 says. And you know what? As Christ strengthens you in your inner man, the Bible says that God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we could ask or think. And so you look at this stuff and think, I can't do this. Well, then you know what? You're getting really close. That, you're right on target. You can't do it. Christ will have to do it through you. And so when you throw up your hands and say, I can't do it, well, you're, on, you're right on target. You're on track. It's got to be Christ living through you. And, uh, and so let's talk about this just for a moment here about emotional responsiveness. Ephesians 5.29 says, um, let's go up to verse 28. It says, So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man, look at this, ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord of the church. Now hold on just a second. He says that that's the way I'm to be living with my wife right there. I'm to be nourishing and cherishing her. That word nourish means to feed. It's not just talking about physical food. My wife can feed herself, let me tell you, all right, physically. She, can, she does a very good job of that. She can, she can take the fork and shovel it in, all right? Right, honey? Right. <laughs> I'm not going to say anything else. That came out wrong, but... <laughs> I told somebody the other day, the first rule of holes. Do you know what it is? When you're in one, stop digging. <laughs> I'm going to stop digging. I'm going to move on. When he talks about nourishing your wife, he's talking about you feeding her in that inner, that inner man, that inner being. That is you being that servant leader, that spiritual leader, that, that you truly are concerned with her well-being. I mean, you're, you are just, you're, you're eaten up with this thing of making sure that she's taken care of, that she's okay. You nourish her. And then that word cherish is a real tender word. That's why I say this is out of the box. Because most of us guys, are, we tend to be more gruff and rough and, you know, and, and we, we, we tend to uh, have an edge to us. But that word cherish, literally means to soften, to warm, like a mother bird on a nest. What an analogy. Like a mother bird on a nest. <laughs> that's what he says I'm supposed to be doing. You think, well, that's good advice for the women. He's talking to the men. And he says that men are to have that tenderness towards their wife. That is... In your handout, it says a husband should express tenderness to his wife. And, you know, so many times I'm afraid, guys, we don't respect our wives' emotions. Can I just tell you, 
that, and again, I'm making a general statement here, but as a rule, God made our wives to be much more deeply emotional than us. That's just the way they're built. And that's why they're so good at what they do that we're not good at. Like, you, you know, about my son getting hurt and he wants mom. Why? Because they are better nurturers. They're better at, at that. Their emotions are deeper. Their emotions run deeper. And, I, and I, so many times, instead of being tender and emotionally responsive to our wife, we kind of we give them the attitude of, you just need to suck it up and keep going. You, know, you just need to toughen up a little bit. You know, come on, quit all this stuff. Tough it up. Come on, suck it up. Let's go. And that's not right. You see, it says in your handout, God did not call us to impress our wives with our masculinity. He called us to be emotionally sensitive to her needs, to her and her needs. Now, guys, I know, especially you guys that lift weights and stuff, guys, we get a really big kick out of going in the mirror and going, and looking at ourselves and, you know, and boy, I mean, we just think that's just so cool, you know. And we just think our wives ought to be impressed by that, too. <laughs> and you're like, look at this, honey. And she's like, yeah, great. <laughs> Can you go mow the grass, please? You know, it's getting up to here, you know. She could care less. And, you know, it, you know what she's looking for is someone who will be emotionally sensitive to her, to her needs. And we missed the boat on this, you know. And, you know, when, when I was at college, um, so many times you would see an a, a attractive girl and she's walking down the hallway and she's dating a guy that, guys, you would think, well, boy, he's a geek. You know, that guy's a... He just, you know, just, you know. <laughs> and he's got this beautiful chick walking with him, you know. And you're thinking, I don't get it. And she could have this. What she want, you know. I told you they're built different than us. And it's because, you see, that guy understood these things. And he understood how to meet the needs there. And he's sensitive to her and he cares for her. And he, and he really genuinely is concerned with her. And he expresses that and he's tender towards her. And that's what she's looking for. You know, if, if Denise is, is down or if Denise is maybe upset, my natural response is to try to solve her problem. You ever try to do that, guys? Think it through rationally. Let's solve the problem. Honey, here's the three-point outline. <laughs> she's upset. She's down. Honey, let me go to the church office. I've got a great three-point outline I preached <laughs> about three weeks ago on this subject, and I believe it'll be a big help to you. Do you know she doesn't want my three-point outline? Can you believe that? You know what? She just wants me... To listen, you know, what, you know, here's the deal. When we try to solve their problem and give them the three-point outline, what do they do? You just don't understand. <laughs> and they're right. We don't. We don't get it. And, and most of the time, they don't want us to solve anything. They just want us to listen and be sensitive and be caring. You haven't solved her problem, but you've done the right thing. How revolutionary when a husband says... Tell me about it, honey, instead of what you need is more sleep. <laughs> you ever try that one, guys? If you just do this, 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 and this, it would solve the problem. And she just goes, oh, and walks off. You don't understand. Am I hitting some buttons tonight? Am I? 
I, you know, you say, how do you know this stuff so good? I've lived it. <laughs> and, you know, there's some guys that I've seen that are always emotionally upsetting their wife. Just always emotionally upsetting her. And I've even seen guys that in some sick way kind of get a kick out of it. They kind of get a, they kind of get a kick out of upsetting their wife emotionally. But man, that is so foreign to the scriptures. You know, my Bible says that I'm to nourish and cherish her, even as the Lord, the church. And so what does that mean? In your handout, when she hurts, you're supposed to hurt. Guys, we are to nourish and cherish our wives. Well, I got some great news. I'm done with the men, and we're going to move on to the ladies. That makes four weeks, guys. We've just been getting hammered. So, <laughs> four weeks. So next week, we move on to the ladies. And hey, guess what I'm going to give you, ladies? I'm going to give you this. I'm going to give you your core role in the marriage. And then, and, and again, it's not, don't, you know, ladies, please just don't not show up next week, okay? Because... <laughs> As I said, your core role is not submit. And that's what a lot of people believe. Well, your role in the marriage is submit. Oh, that's great. Oh, my role is just get out of the way. <laughs> you know, no, that's not your core role. You have an active, vibrant, important, contributing core role in the, in the, in the home. And so next week, we're going to talk about your core role. Then, you know what I'm going to give you? What every husband needs to succeed. And we're going to look at what his for needs are, and, and they need to be your core concerns, ladies. Because guess what? Many times women are unaware of their husband's needs. They think their husband's built like them. And so they think their needs are his needs, and they're not. They're different. And guess what? If you don't meet those needs in your husband's life, there'll be some floozy at work that will. And so you, and, and again, that's not right, and he should not at all give in to that. I mean, he needs to run from that like Joseph did. That, that's no excuse. But what I'm saying is, I'm simply saying, I'm giving you reality, that you need to know what your husband's core needs are. And, and you need to know your core role. So next week, we're going to get into that. And uh, I just encourage you, if you've missed any along the way, Go on the website and just download them or watch the video and, and, and get caught up. And let's all come back next Sunday night and let's continue this series. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Thank you for coming tonight.